care of. You're going into that, I suppose. Okay, I was I was going to ask, um, bonobos are more promiscuous than are chimpanzees, and uh, chimpanzees more promiscuous, I believe, than gorillas. Um, sure. Okay, and um, which of these are still the type that would uh, kill a baby of a species because the male, the male would kill the, the baby because it uh, wasn't well. His own. The common chimps are pretty, uh, pretty nasty and aggressive about killing. Yeah. Uh, they typically will kill juveniles of other chimpanzee bands, but not the juveniles within their own band. But they do practice band wide promiscuity. So, because they are pretty vicious animals, band wide promiscuity is, is very useful for females among chimps. So it, it works within the band, just not outside the band. In chimps, uh, isn't there an alpha male that has kind of a harem, and there are a lot of males that not, not really do with chimps, with gorillas, that's certainly true. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little okay. bit here. Okay. So this graphic shows sexual dimorphism <coughs> ratios for us and our four nearest neighbors, both for body mass and the size of sexual characteristics. So the top row shows the body mass of a male relative to the body mass of female. Uh, you can see that gorillas have the greatest level of sexual dimorphism. Males average about 2.3 times the mass of females. Humans and chimps both have a, a, a mass ratio of about 1.2, uh, smaller but still significant. Now, it also shows the relative size of the male genitalia. And here you see something that seems counterintuitive. An erect gorilla dick is about 2 inches long. That's some mighty modest twiggage for a 400 pound gorilla. <laughs> Chimps come in at about twice that size, sporting about four inches. But humans are the undisputed champions. We definitely got the biggest dicks. But when it comes to big ballers, chimps take the cake. They lug around some heavy hangers and swing some major huevos. But here in the heavyweight division, same story. They got mouse nuts to go with their pin grips. <laughs> and we'll see why momentarily. Uh, the second row shows female dimorphism relative to males. Notice that breasts are a major sexual indicator for humans, but not really for the other species. Uh, breasts are a very precise indicator of female reproductive status, what's called an honest advertisement in biology. <laughs> so some perspective on sexual dimorphism for various mammalian species. Given have a mass ratio of 1.0. Males and females weigh exactly the same amount. And they are strictly monogamous. Gorillas and orangutans have a mass ratio of uh, greater than 2. And for both of them, dominant males preside over a harem of multiple females. Silverbacks and redbeards control sexual access to females in their harem and deny that access to any other male. There's a clear correlation between level of sexual dimorphism and harem type mating systems. Gorilla harems typically consist of several females per alpha silverback. Mm -hmm. An even more extreme example is seen in the elephant seal. Their body mass ratio of 3.6 corresponds to a harem of up to 12. The human ratio of 1.2 corresponds to a mildly polygynous species, where semi-monogamous, sometimes considered serially monogamous. The modern divorce pattern is actually closer to our natural state their rigid, given style, lifelong monogamy would be. There's some data that suggests that a four year itch still exists. That, remember, that's the time required for juveniles to uh, reach survival autonomy. No, the seven year itch. No, the seven year itch, um, yeah, I mean, that, that exists too, but uh, there's a bit of, if you look at the war statistics, there's a peak around four years. So typically, an estrous female will copulate with any male who is willing and able. The males may have their own ways to sort out access to females, as we saw with the harem species. But fertile females generally take all comers. We saw the evolutionary advantage or even necessity of female promiscuity uh, taking away the incentive for males to kill juveniles, especially important for the aggressive species. So for species where females mate with multiple males in succession, evolution can select on the basis of what's called sperm competition. 
Males that produce more sperm have a higher probability of fathering the next generation. To take some extreme examples, here you see the Gibbons. Recall that Gibbons live as strictly monogamous pairs with a body mass ratio of 1. They don't need big balls because their mating structure keeps rival males away. Gorillas also have small balls. Even though silverback males have a harem of several females, again, their mating structure eliminates sperm competition, so even small balls are big enough. <coughs> At the other extreme are the chimps. They have the biggest balls of all the primates by a substantial margin. If your neighbor is pumping buckets, you've got to get out the fire hose, or you'll be left behind in the evolutionary arms race. Humans are here, right on the mean line. Our evolutionary history does not include the kind of sperm competition seen by the chimps. However, female access to alternative sex partners is not as controlled for gibbons or gorillas. And the evolution of testes size is relatively simple and easily understood. Penis size is a little more puzzling. They produce a, a lot of jizz. And the mystery is, why does man have such a big dick? If you consult the literature, there's three leading theories. Female choice, male competition, and sperm competition. First, ladies like them big. The idea is that females prefer to have sex with well-hung males, resulting in the selection pressure for bigger dicks. Plausible. Second, male competition. Dick size was used by males to create a non-violent pecking order, like drawing straws. The guy with the biggest boner gets first dibs. Plausible. And third, the sloppy second, clean out. I'm not making this up. Uh, <laughs> the idea that a larger dick will squish out the cum load from the previous male. You think? Personally, I don't think any of these theories is an adequate explanation for the human endowment. At least not on their own. As usual, I look for how all the variables interact in our evolutionary equation. It doesn't make sense to look for simple answers to complex problems. But the shape looks different. Yeah. This one's more sort of like plunger like, which might move yeah. the size, and the others are just sort of like. little twiggy <laughs> I mean, structures. It, 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 it is a little weird. The and, you know, and there's probably some truth to, there could be some truth to all of those theories, but we're going to try to put them together and uh, get a more comprehensive picture. So the development of such outlandishly oversized equipment requires an evolutionary ratchet driven by multivariate adjustment. I'll present my own hypothesis later, but first we have one more stop, even more mysterious, the female orgasm. So what's up with a female orgasm? Mm -hmm. A boorish lout can hop on, pop it in, saw away, shoot his load, roll over and fall asleep in half a minute. <laughs> but women don't work that way. <clears throat> female orgasm takes more time and effort, and may not happen at all without proper care and cultivation. Here in the good old U.S. of A, a sizable fraction of females never orgasm at all. It almost seems like men aren't made to satisfy women, or maybe that the parameters of sexual performance for males and females are mismatched. People have been wondering about that for quite a while. Here we see Botticelli's Mars and Venus, this is uh, 1485, where we see Mars all shagged out after a <laughs> tough campaign in the trenches, while Venus is looking wistfully ready for another round. This here is a basic tantric sex position, eliminating the kind of rude chump thrusting of gone in 60 seconds style sex. We'll hear more about this one later, too. So, here's a hypothesis to explain the male-female mismatch. Our differential response times are a leftover adaptation from a time when females had multiple sex partners in rapid succession. In that kind of mating system, our differential response is no mismatch at all. And this provides the key to a new hypothesis solving some of the most intriguing puzzles of human sexuality. Solving the mysteries of the big dick and the female orgasm. You, you heard it here first. So, what's the evolutionary value of female orgasm? At the most basic level, it's a reward mechanism that motivates females to have more sex. Sex is necessary to produce children, but also more sex with more different partners enables females to obtain more resources for themselves and their children. It's a good networking tool, and orgasm is a good motivator. But there's also an important secondary effect. 
During orgasm, the cervix will spasm along with the rest of the body, allowing more sperm to enter the uterus. Consider what that means. If a woman has sex with multiple males while ovulating, each of them has a chance of being the father. Each of them will be motivated to provide resources and protection to that child. But the female can stack the deck. If she comes only with a favorite, then she shifts the odds in his favor. If her favorite has higher genetic fitness, then she's just shifted in favor of her offspring. Females who can do that, orgasm preferentially with the fittest males, will win genetic competition against their less discriminating systems. So, it's my hypothesis that female orgasm and big dicks co-evolve together. Here's some evidence. First, female orgasm triggers male orgasm. As Albert King put it in Longmont Blues, if the Warsham don't get you, the Rainchin show will. <laughs> but, it, but it's more difficult, but it, it's more than just the vaginal twitch. There's also a psychological component that makes it very difficult for males to resist coming when their partner does. It's how we're built. Here's where that big dick comes in. She may have already been irrigated, but if she hasn't had an orgasm yet, few of those hard swimming sperm will have made it past the surface. Remember the idea of the big dick and the sloppy seconds clean out? A dick that's big enough to completely fill the vagina will displace semen left by the previous occupant. That's why they're called sloppy seconds. So when male and female have a mutual orgasm and her cervix opens, he's ejaculating right on the bullseye, the door is open, and the previous cum loads have been cleaned out. Consider that deck stat. Second, a man who can delay orgasm until his partner comes first is providing an immediate demonstration of his fitness for reproduction of the child rear. Planning, self-control, consideration for others, all very advantageous characteristics. Even if she knows nothing else about the guy, that right there tells her he's got the right stuff. So even if she's had sex with every guy on the flyer, the man who gets her to come can win the sperm competition. Among chimps, <coughs> sperm competition is waged by flooding the female with copious quantities of jizz. But humans are all about smarts, and skill, and communication. That's why we have men with big dicks and women who come hard. But they make you work for it.